see the beautiful flag. Welcome to the talk. We'll get started momentarily. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Like last time I was saying it was a job, a practice job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Joe, for joining those of you in person and those of you online. Um, I'm Meg Bithma. I'm a, a former McFarland professor at the um, Harvard Business School, and I run the China Economy Lecture Series here at the Fairbanks Center. Um, and so today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jonas Nam from the School of, of Advanced and International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, professor Nam is an assistant professor in the Energy and Environment Department at the Thais uh, School um, and is very generously sharing with us today his research on China um, and the, the role of climate and clean energy um, in China and in the U.S. and elsewhere. So Jonas's work, uh, Professor Nam's work, runs a kind of thread through industrial policy, political economy, and a firm-based approach to climate issues. Um, he's going to be sharing material from his book here today. It's called Collaborative Advantage, as you see. Um, excitingly, the book just won two major book awards, the Science and Technology Award for the American Political Science Association and the International Political Economy Award for the International Studies Association, which is very exciting. Um, he's also published in Science and in Nature and in a dozen or so academic journals on issues related to China, the U.S., China's clean energy policies, um, as well as issues related to decoupling in the U.S.-China climate relationship. And so um, we're pleased to have him. So we'll go until 5.30 today, not any um, any time after that. And so he'll talk for a little bit, and then we'll do some questions and have a discussion. So thank you, Jonas, for joining us. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, since we're sort of in a busy grouping here, feel free to interrupt me and sort of Hear this thing in whichever way uh, is interesting to you. Um, my plan is to sort of um, briefly uh, kind of talk about the, the core outcome that the book explains, um, you know, then explain my argument that Meg is very familiar with uh, because she helped me craft it over, <laughs> over many months of text messages and phone calls. And, and then I wanted to talk about two of the cases, uh, the German and the, the Chinese case, obviously the China case in it, and then sort of end by, by thinking a little bit more broadly about what this means for economic decoupling, uh, particularly in the climate space. But I think, um, you know, since this uh, book was sent off and the manuscript was sent off, I think the decoupling problem has become much broader in a way, or the discussions about it. And so we can maybe sort of think a little bit about um, what that means. Uh, for other sectors uh, as well, like biotech and, and semiconductors. So I'll be calling on you to, to explain it to us. Um, but let me sort of, before I dive into China, start in the US, right? So this summer, um, uh, President Biden signed the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, which may or may not um, reduce inflation. But it's not really about that. At the core, it's a sort of industrial policy initiative. And in many ways, an industrial policy initiative that at least in the clean tech spaces, um, responds to China. And so uh, it's a bill that contains very ambitious local content regulation in order to bring uh, these supply chains back um, uh, to the US. And, and these are local content regulations that in many ways are exactly the kinds of local content regulations that the US has fought for many decades uh, in China. And this is not a book uh, about why the US uh, needs to do this now, why it didn't get what it wanted in these industries. Um, but it is a book about um, sort of how the U.S. ended up in this particular spot in the global division of power, and that's an argument that I make in the book that we can't really understand without also understanding where China sits in these sectors. And so um, the answer to these questions, sort of where where does America stand, where is Europe in these clean tech industries that are very um, salient politically and also very attractive to policymakers. Uh, really begins in China. When I started working on this project um, many, many years ago, uh, I started really by, by wanting to understand why China was dominating um, wind, solar industries at the time. It's now also dominating other clean tech industries like batteries. Um, and in the United States back then under the Obama administration, uh, the administration had sort of declared that we were now in a clean energy race. Uh, 
with China. And it seemed at this time that China was winning um, very clearly. Solyndra was a big uh, US sort of case of a solar manufacturer that had gone bankrupt um, with a lot of government money. Uh, China was sort of advancing very quickly in these sectors and dominating wind and solar production globally, the components for wind, uh, including in wind turbines that were uh, installed in the United States. And in other parts of the world, there were, there were similar worries. In Germany, there were broad, a much broader discussion at the time about whether the German economy with the sort of very peculiar German vocational training institutions and financing kind of structures could be competitive in a global economy that was sort of dominated by China. So these were not just uh, conversations about sort of the structure of supply chain, but really also uh, conversations about sort of the viability of um, a way of life uh, within that global economy that now was increasingly an economy that China was uh, was playing a big role in. When I started doing field work, and so a lot of the book is really about sort of shop floor interviews uh, in, in factories like the one on this picture, um, I didn't really find a race at all. And so the project changed very quickly. It was really a project uh, about collaboration between German, Chinese, and American uh, firms in wind and solar sectors um, that I found sort of working together in these sectors. And so Chinese firms were, uh, of course, very competitive in these industries, but they were not competitive um, in everything. And they were working with firms from other parts of the world in order to get these technologies to market. And so even if a lot of things said made in China, the solar panels or the wind turbines, they had um, a lot of ingredients from other parts of the world. And so China's industrial parks really were just centers of sort of central nodes in a division of labor, um, centers of collaboration, if you will, um, in this division of labor, and not really the beachheads and sort of an industrial policy race between these different places. And so German firms were, as I then found out, working on customizations with the kinds of automation equipment that Chinese firms were using to produce these uh, technologies. Um, Chinese firms were what I termed innovative manufacturing, uh, sort of the kinds of innovation related to commercialization and rapid scale up to mass production in these industries. And American firms were part of it too. They were really sort of focused on what we would call invention, the sort of Silicon Valley type focus on the kinds of innovation that you need to bring um, new products um, to market. And firms were picking these very different specializations in these global industries, even though they were supported domestically with very similar industrial policy tools that sort of combined on the one hand, um, kind of technology uh, push incentives, so R&D subsidies, that sort of stuff. And on the other hand, um, kind of market whole policies that created domestic markets for clean energy technologies at the time. And so, uh, we saw very different kinds of industrial specialization, even though the policy environment was very similar actually in Germany, China, and, and the US at the time. I won't go into that in much detail, but China, for instance, copied a lot of the industrial policy tools exactly from other places. And so there was a lot of similarity. And that was in many ways because there was a similar political logic behind this sort of industrial policy use, right? What started as really open-ended explorations of these new technologies very quickly became sizable industries. And so governments wanted to not just spend money subsidizing wind and solar domestically, but they wanted to see domestic economic results. And so we sort of saw this convergence of industrial policy goals and industrial policy tools. What we didn't see was a convergence of the kinds of uh, industrial specializations in these, uh, in these sectors. And so wind and solar investment globally grew over time, um, and not just in rich economies, but in developing economies too. And China made up an increasingly large share. Um, this is China here in the middle um, of global investment in these sectors. But firms responded with very different kinds of domestic uh, industrial specializations. For sort of from a political science perspective, it was also interesting, or maybe surprising even, that. Um, that these firms picked such different industrialized specializations in these places, because these were all post-globalization industries. And so we had this sort of reorganization of the global economy in the 1990s, China's accession to the WTO in the early 2000s, and then these industries matured afterwards. And so uh, in many ways, there was an opportunity for a break with these existing industrial patterns, and we didn't really see that break. We saw very distinct specializations, even though uh, they were post-industrial 
uh, post-globalization post sectors and one of the first post-globalization sectors. And so what we got instead was this division of labor where all sorts of new technologies came to market and they came to market um, sort of as a result of a collaboration between these different kinds of uh, companies from different parts of the world. And so the central question that I'm really asking in this book um, is why firms picked such distinct industrial specializations in the global economy and defines all the these government goals that in many ways wanted all of these different activities domestically. Um, and then defines also of the sort of industrial policies that actually converge quite a bit uh, across these three economies. And the argument that I make in the book um, is that globalization itself is responsible for uh, or enables rather these distinct industrial specializations in these different places and, and that globalization itself sort of enables this consistent um, divergence of industrial specializations in different places. And so um, China and the kind of global economic system that it helped create uh, didn't threaten the kind of German economic practices, but actually enabled Germany to keep doing what they had been doing for a long time and to refine it and apply it and adjust it for new industrial sectors. Uh, and they also sort of in many ways made American industrial specializations more American. And so it kind of reinforced this focus on invention and the sort of traditional uh, kind of strength in many ways of the American system. And so I think to make sense of that argument, we should spend just one second kind of thinking about what globalization actually means um, and, and or sort of what we mean by it. And so if globalization is all, um, so if we sort of step back and, and sort of um, define globalization, I think different disciplines have very different approaches to it. Uh, we can think about globalization as sort of primarily a process of kind of reaping gains from trade um, based on kind of comparative advantage. And so in that sense, globalization is something like progressive outsourcing. I don't think there's any economists here, so I can sort of attribute that very freely to the uh, economists and the folks online will just have to deal. Um, there's also globalization that sort of primarily as a process of sort of dealing with the competitive pressures that come from the global economy. I think that's a very political science approach, like how much domestic policy making economy do we still have? Can institutions survive? I think that very much was kind of the German worry about China's rise in the global economy. Could Germany survive economically with these institutions that in many ways are sort of you know, at least decades, but maybe hundreds of years old in a, in a very different environment? And then the sort of perspective, and I don't think either of them are wrong, but I sort of highlight a third perspective in the book that it really sees globalization as a um, process that is primarily about collaboration. I think that is often missed in these other perspectives. And so um, if we think about globalization as primarily uh, opening new pathways for collaboration in the global economy, um, then we can sort of think about uh, collaborative advantage, which is the title of the book and one that um, Meg came up with on a bike in Harvard Square as we were on the phone at some point um, a <laughs> few years ago. So we can think about collaborative advantage as the process through which firms uh, participate in these global production systems and sort of take advantage of the benefits that they can derive from it. And so I argue that there's sort of two benefits that firms get from participating in this global system. The first is that because of these new opportunities for collaboration in the global economy, as a result of the changes that we saw in the 1990s that sort of culminated with China participating, um, firms can participate in a global division of labor that allows them to specialize. Like they no longer have to do everything. They can focus on very narrow sets of activities and then work with other firms in other parts of the world. Um, to get new products to market. And so in order to enter the solar industry, you don't have to know everything about the solar industry. You can do this uh, in a very narrow particular way. And so co collaboration in that sense, um, obviates the need to establish all the skills required to uh, develop, commercialize, um, and produce new technologies, and instead um, allows firms to uh, specialize in distinct steps. And so you can contrast that, for instance, with the sort of four uh, conglomerates that also own the rubber plants and everything is sort of in one company. This is the opposite of that. We don't need to do that anymore. And so in, 
in many ways, that's a, a kind of the economic manifestation of collaborative advantage. And the second benefit that firms uh, get from participating is that these new um, possibilities for specialization allow them to work with existing skills and existing domestic institutions. And so these institutions no longer have to support all sorts of activities, but can focus on very distinct and narrow sets of skills. Um, and so firms can repurpose existing institutions for participating in these new industries. And so that's a kind of political manifestation um, of this argument. And so by allowing firms to specialize and build on these existing domestic skills and existing domestic institutions, globalization enables the, this persistent and consequential divergence of national uh, industrial specialization. So precisely the kinds of institutions that, for instance, the Germans were worried about would be threatened by China's rise in the global economy survived, I argue, because of China's participation in, these, uh, in this division of labor. And so maybe this is a little abstract. So one example, this is one of the companies that I really love that I visited many times in this, in this process. Um, it's a German sort of small, medium-sized firm, family-owned, was a supplier to the auto industry, uh, eventually entered the solar industry by building on sort of existing knowledge. It added new skills um, adopted from other industrial sectors and then uh, developed eventually production equipment for the solar industry. But it did so together with Chinese partners. And so it could only kind of build on this existing German strength and customization, take advantage of the existing German vocational training system and the existing financing institutions because it had Chinese partners on the other side that created demand for these kinds of products, um, but also uh, sort of helped in, in, in making them possible. And so instead of undermining these traditional economic institutions, um, I think we see this particularly in Europe, which is why I sort of come back to the German example many times, but these sort of traditional economic institutions that we see in, in many places, um, globalization allowed firms to kind of reinvest in them and strengthen them, um, and also allowed new firms in these new industries to become part of the political coalitions that support these industrial sectors. And that is because these institutions no longer have to support everything. Germany had to just do customization but participate in these sectors while relying on other firms to do other things. And so if we sort of think back to kind of some of the uh, political science literatures on this, um, what we got was in many ways quite, quite the opposite of a race. Um, it was because of this collaboration in global supply chains that um, traditional industrial specializations and uh, their underlying kind of economic institutions survived and became part of these new industrial sectors. And China was sort of very central part in enabling and allowing for that. Um, it was also because of these uh, institutions that wind and solar sort of collectively became mature industrial sectors that are now at the core of um, kind of climate politics um, today. And so I'm going to talk through these two cases, Germany and China, as sort of as separate cases, but in, in many ways, we can't really understand them uh, on their own. They are so tightly linked. And then sort of a story that now relates to these um, questions about decoupling, right? So they're tightly linked in the creation of these sectors of places. I think now there's a political push to move away from this kind of integration. And I think there are real debates um, about whether that's possible. Uh, given sort of this complementary set of skills that have existed for a long time in these places that now have to come um, from elsewhere. So let me just, I know this is the China economy seminar, so I'll start with Germany and then sort of dangle China as the carrot at the very end. But um, I think Germany is sort of an interesting case, not just because I'm German and I, I speak German, but also because I think the sort of worry about China um, and the sort of economic competitiveness in a world dominated by China was particularly acute there. I think people often forget in the early 2000s, um, Germany had a sort of a very long recession economically. It was kind of the, the laggard uh, in Europe. And there were a lot of concerns about what globalization would do to this traditional system, especially as China sort of uh, came on board um, and in many ways started announcing that it would compete with this traditional manufacturing strength of the German economy, right? To this day, I think manufacturing is something like 25% of GDP in Germany, which is a much, much higher share, similar to Japan, uh, but very different from, from many other uh, economies. And so what I'm arguing essentially is that China helped Germany revive 
I think said that industrial specializations and make them survive and the future. And so um, what, what I'm arguing is that because German small and medium-sized firms could enter wind and solar sectors through collaboration with Chinese partners, they were able to build on these house banks, the kind of German traditional foundational uh, training uh, system, and also kind of R&D institutions that are targeted at small and medium-sized firms that have been around for 70 or 80 years at this point. And that was because of uh, the ability to work with Chinese partners. And so Germany had very similar industrial policies uh, as these other cases. The German uh, kind of market support mechanism was the German kind of feed and tariff law. I don't need to go too technical out there, but the feed and tariff law was basically copied in China's renewable energy law in 2007. So there was sort of clear um, also um, kind of cross influence in industrial policy making between those two cases. But uh, German firms focused on small scale customization of um, production equipment um, with a high degree of manual labor. These were often uh, family sized, family owned businesses making components, um, production equipment, uh, things that don't have large production runs but are extremely customized um, for their customers. Um, and so that was kind of the core of the German wind and solar industry for the longest time, and one that I think German politics itself kind of missed. I think there was a lot of discussion about um, Chinese firms putting German solar plants out of business, but I think sort of the public conversation missed that the majority of jobs and the, the biggest economic chunk really came from these firms that were working with China. Um, so for instance, one of these firms um, was, was founded as a Foundry in the 1800s, then made uh, lumber mill saws that started making manufacturing equipment for, for furniture making, then got into the semiconductor kind of screen print, printer space, um, then kind of merged into the solar equipment space and started working with Chinese partners from the beginning because China at the time was automating the solar industry very rapidly because of high labor turnover. And so um, together, these firms then sort of developed new kinds of um, equipment for the solar space and won a bunch of uh, efficiency awards. And so it's sort of hard to imagine this trajectory without some of the German institutions, but also without the Chinese partners and the kind of engineering collaboration that happened there. And so they didn't do it alone. For these German wind and solar firms, Chinese partners kind of complemented uh, the German manufacturers, which which the main focus on kind of small scale customization and then license things off as, as soon as larger production runs needed to uh, occur. Um, China provided incentives to develop these targeted wind and solar technologies, these high end components, the manufacturing equipment, all of that uh, came from, from China. And China was, as I just said, um, one of the first places to automate uh, these industries. And so what you see is for the longest time um, growing exports from Germany to China. Germany had a trade surplus with China in these sectors for a long time um, as a result of these uh, collaborations. I have many anecdotes to talk about these firms and sort of technology examples, but I think I'll, I'll say that maybe for a discussion later. Interestingly though, and I think that's sort of the key point here, is that when I interviewed firms about what enabled them to participate in this collaboration with China, what was the root of this ability of to maintain a trade surplus with China in these sectors, they were precisely the kinds of institutions that sort of political science at the time had argued was slowly dying in the German economy. It was precisely the kind of training institutions and the sort of financing institutions that many uh, argued were making the German economy uncompetitive. And instead what happened is the two sort of nations um, benefited and kind of grew together. So I think the German kind of economic boom uh, since the early 2000s was very tightly linked to, to China. And, and so Germany basically went through the financial crisis in 2009 and stayed. Yes. Before you move on to China, I yes. want to ask one question. Do you think the synergies were tied as it was because of the Chinese industrial structure at the time? Or as China moved up the value chain, eventually would crowd out these types of synergies? This yeah. is part of the policy debate in Germany today, right? Is, you know, was this a temporary synergy that eventually would lead to a crowding out versus are these two synergistic industrial structures that right, eventually will not lead to, right? So I think that, yeah. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, right, this is a historical picture, but even if 
the trade war decoupling supply chain resiliency had never happened. And we just kept playing the movie forward. Would we have a continued synergy or we start to see competition as a result of this? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been so. I think the clearest cases to examine them are the ones where Chinese firms bought the German manufacturer. And then you look at sort of how this evolved over time, right? And for most of the cases that I've come across, a lot of the R&D that is specific to this kind of customization work, to the components and to the manufacturing equipment, for instance, in robotics, um, stays in Germany to a large part because that's where you have the kind of workforce that you need. You have a lot of the sort of ecosystem around it that you need. And so, you know, I think there were a lot of concerns about these purchases in Germany at the time, but we haven't really seen kind of a wholesale move of that stuff to China as a result. And so, you know, if they are kind of almost within the same company at this point, um, you see the sort of division of labor between these two locations continue. Um, and so maybe the German place, the German manufacturer will make the first 50 components that need to be tweaked a lot, that have a lot of kind of close interaction between the customer and the, the manufacturer. Once you've figured out the sort of early stuff, China is much better at then tweaking that design to make it mass manufacturable and bring it up to, to scale. And I think that's what we see still in um, the examples that I interviewed in these for, for this book, but it, to some extent, even kind of KUKA and, and sort of the robot firms, uh, Putzmeister, there's like a few other sort of high, high kind of publicly discussed examples where I haven't seen, I mean, there are many, we've talked about the KUKA case, I guess, for hours separately, and there's lots of things that didn't work out so well there, but, you know, they didn't kind of shut down the German location and moved it because I think they benefit from these institutional advantages that exist in the German case and that the firms kind of have very um have been able to use I think to build these kind of strategic strength right and giving that up I think is a, is a, comes at a big cost and, and so I think in China we see kind of the flip side of this because China was trying to move out of manufacturing at the time right and so um you had all of the support for manufacturing at the local level, and then you had a central government basically pushing industrial policy that was all about indigenous innovation, um, kind of moving out of simple manufacturing um, and, and sort of thinking about how to structurally change the domestic economy at the time. Um, and in, in many ways sort of concerned about the middle income trap. So we got here, what do we do next? Um, and so you had this kind of contradiction almost between what local governments were doing what central governments were doing, but it was very much about encouraging firms to move up the manufacturing, but ideally move beyond manufacturing and then to push some of the, the production activities to other parts um, in Asia. And so what I see in the Chinese case is that the kind of real critical institutions were um, kind of local government support for manufacturing that allowed firms to really develop these skills and scale and mass production. And I don't mean this in, in sort of a derogatory way. I think there's a lot of innovation that goes into that. There are R&D teams that work on these things. Um, so, you know, if you visit these companies, it doesn't look that different from sort of the Western R&D uh, institution, but it's focused on sort of how to take technologies maybe invented in an American startup and sort of bring it to mass production. And so China too used uh, very similar kind of national industrial policy frameworks to do this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of them directly came from other countries. And so this sort of feed and tariff idea of subsidizing uh, electricity made with wind and solar um, was kind of copied on the German law at the time. Um, but what you got from firms was not a focus on the sort of indigenous innovation that the center was putting and then, you know, made in China 2025 was pushing and then the central government was still pushing even when we weren't talking about made in China 2025 anymore. Um, but what we got was a focus on precisely the kinds of innovation that we need to take these technologies and scale them up to mass production. Um, and so as a result, China basically now accounts for most of the production in these sectors which isn't because of factor cost advantages, energy is much cheaper in the US for these industries. So, you know, they're highly automated. We could make the stuff here. Um, a lot of it is about the kind of capabilities and the skills and the sort of engineering schools that surround it um, that allowed them uh, to do this. So today, I mean, China still makes 97% of wafers for the solar industry. It makes more than half of the um, kind of wind turbine, the cells, like the big sort of metal castings that all the components fit in. Um, there's lots of parts 
in the supply chain where it's incredibly dominant, like rare earths from, from magnets. You need a lot of magnets and wind turbines. Um, China makes more than 90% of those. Um, and now also a growing share of lithium ion batteries. So we've sort of expanded into other clean tech industries that are not part of this book, but that luckily for me follow a similar uh, pattern. And the reason um, why firms focused on this at the time was really because you could buy, license, learn a lot of these other things from other firms in the world, but what you couldn't do uh, is learn the manufacturing part because no one had actually brought these industries to mass production before. If you drive from Los Angeles to Palm Springs, you see sort of burned out wind turbines on the side of the road. This is from the 1990s when these were sort of cottage industries, people bolting together stuff in their garage and trying to kind of make energy a new way. This wasn't a very advanced industry with kind of off-the-shelf components and sort of you know very well-established design principles. And so I think Chinese firms at the time saw an opportunity to do something, um, but also didn't want to replicate things that they could get through collaboration with others. Why reinvent the wheel, focus on the stuff that you can buy in these global chains? And so, of course, they didn't do it alone. They, they did it sort of in collaboration. And Mark, that's exactly sort of to your point. So Goldwind, for instance, has been uh, it's one of the big kind of famous Chinese uh, wind manufacturers, beautiful name, so everyone talks about it. It's no longer the biggest. Uh, but they very early on started working with uh, Vensys, um, which is a German company that developed a technology for gearless uh, wind turbines, gearboxes are very expensive. They break all the time, so they're sort of maintenance intensive. And, and Densis has a technology that basically gets rid of the gearbox. Um, they eventually took a direct uh, stake in the company, but the sort of division of labor exists to this day, where the sort of core technology development for this gearbox part is done in Germany, and then China has the expertise um, to scale it up to mass production in these industries. And so that collab collaboration endured over time. It also endured and we no longer have the A63 uh, program for, for applied technologies, but that was really very much targeted at, at indigenous innovation at the time. And the government sort of tolerated this ongoing collaboration as long as there was a kind of Chinese brand name at the end on the product, um, but it wasn't just solely a Chinese uh, thing. And so in order to do that, these firms relied on kind of a host of institutions at the local level in China for mass production that continue to exist to this day. And I think the key, um, the real key sort of um, innovation here is the kind of financial sector that is willing to fund mass production. And so Chinese firms were able to build with um, kind of various generous loans, so-called golden lines, so entire manufacturing plants that are only dedicated to research and development purposes. Um, and those financial um, the loans were basically um, brokered and often backed by local governments uh, in China at a time when firms in other parts of the world were not getting financing for these new industries that were unproven, still very expensive. Uh, and not something anyone wanted to invest in. And so if you look at sort of like their financial filings and their short-term debt, you can see that even after the financial crisis in 2009, these firms were able to raise more money for more investment and capacity. And so this is a real kind of important part of creating uh, an infrastructure for this sort of knowledge and mass production. And as a result, um, we've had these incredible cost declines of these technologies that have now made solar the cheapest source of energy in many parts of the world, and China kind of a critical contributor to the solution to the climate problem because we now have these uh, cheap kind of solar technologies. But of course, they also relied on materials from the US. They relied on kind of the German production equipment. This was a joint uh, endeavor, but one that really came together in China and was funded by Chinese development banks and backed by local government. It um, didn't always go well, of course, and we can talk about that too, lots of you know, bankruptcies and, and sort of bad debt. But, but the that also sort of allowed uh, this particular um, specialization. And so where does this um, leave us? So let's shift sort of a little bit to uh, a discussion about economic decoupling, I think. And so um, in some ways, this book became sort of a historical book on the process of writing it because the world shifted very much while it was under review. 
And so, uh, you know, my argument really is that globalization allowed for these distinct specializations, and it was only because of this kind of cross-border exchange and these very tight linkages between firms um, that that firms in different parts of the world uh, could do these things, and that they could kind of revive and maintain these legacy institutions uh, that continue to have value in these new industries. And so, it turns out that. Um, perhaps globalization itself is uh, the, the thing we need to save and not not so much um, these institutions that many worry would die and then a globalized economy and that I think got more acute during the um, you know, COVID-19 pandemic because I think there was a lot of uncertainty in global supply chains in many ways that didn't work so there was kind of a renewed focus on bringing things home um, but I think that was just one of many factors, um, and so um, kind of tensions in the U.S.-China relationship have sort of pushed us to think about decoupling. Um, the Europeans are thinking about reshoring a lot of these industries. I think in general, there's sort of a, a different flavor in these, um, and a new kind of mercantilist trade policy in many ways um, kind of taking place around the world. And so you know, when I talked about the Inflation Reduction Act at the very beginning, I mean, in many ways, this is a very clearly sort of targeted bill that, that tries to bring manufacturing back from China. In the battery space, for instance, the tax credits that you now get for electric vehicles, you only get if none of the materials that go into the battery are refined or manufactured in China. It's one of the few things we have in this space that actually name a country and sort of say we want to pull it back. Um, and there are all sorts of national security arguments for this, of course, and the political logic that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but if I'm right with this book and the sort of need to embed these activities in local kind of age-old institutions, then it's going to be very hard to do that. Um, as someone who works on climate and kind of pick these clean energy uh, sectors for that reason, that makes me worried because uh, it's going to be very hard to decouple uh, in the time frame. Um, that we have left to fix the kind of decarbonization uh, issue. And so um, there might be long-term stuff that you can need to reach jiggle these supply chains and kind of reshape them globally. But if emissions have to peak well before 2030 in order to kind of avert the worst um, sort of climate consequences, then we don't have much time to do that. And so for now, um, meeting these climate goals will require collaboration. Uh, with China it still makes you know two thirds of the solar panels, even though the US has um, long had trade remedies in place to try to re uh, shift these supply chains to other parts of Asia. Um, you know, it makes most of the wind turbines in the world. It's one of the largest, I think, the EU just kind of pulled, pulled even with China uh, market for electric vehicles, and it makes um, you know, most of the batteries that go into these electric vehicles. And so we see this now in, in kind of new sectors playing out very similar things, American battery chemistries, German production equipment, uh, Chinese loans, bringing these um, different entrepreneurs together in China and then rapidly expanding the production scale of lithium iron manufacturing uh, in China. And so um, there's a little bit of activity sort of up here as, as countries are throwing um, a lot of public money at trying to reshape these supply chains, but it's um, a slow process. And actually, a lot of the raw materials that then go into batteries that are manufactured here or in Europe are still refined in China because China is the only place that knows how to do it at the moment. And so maybe one way to think about it is uh, sort of a more conscious collaboration approach that can combine these two things. I don't think decoupling uh, is the solution. I also think it's unreasonable to think that all of these technologies need to be brought in from elsewhere if they're subsidized and sort of made possible with domestic regulation. And so maybe it doesn't have to be a zero sum game and we can do both at the same time. Can we, in the short run, accept that there are few alternatives to this division of labor that has benefited American startups and European firms, but also benefited Chinese manufacturers. And in the long term, still at the best in a different kind of competitiveness and different kinds of institutions here uh, to support different kinds of economic activity. And that would mean learning from China actually more than uh, trying to keep China out. So maybe thinking about a national development bank for manufacturing this has been proposed in the past, but never passed. And so um, these are sort of the two levers, I think, um, in, this, in this moment. So I guess he and Biden are talking again, uh, the climate talks might, might sort of be back on track. Um, 
but I think we're still very far from sort of trying to combine these things. And for now, it's a very zero sum uh, game. And so with that, thank you for um, sticking around this conversation. Great, thank you. So I see the questions rolling in online. Um, I'm gonna come up so I can see them. Okay. Is that okay? Or do you wanna look at them yourself? I'll, I'll come up so that I can see that. Um, but let me just take my privilege by asking the first question here, as long as no one mind, which is basically um, the, the the security question in one way, which is like the, the so the argument right about sometimes about decoupling is sometimes about we'll use technologies and um, you know espionage, et cetera, right? I don't think that's the argument people make, right, about some of the clean technologies. Um, but then the argument that people make then is about economic coercion or weaponization or withdrawal right, of supplies. And so if we live in a world where, you know, you show the statistics on China making, you know, 35% of this and 55% of that, is that a dangerous world, especially when we think about rare earths and lithium and batteries, et cetera? So what, what do you say about things like that when people are? Yeah, I mean, it's a complicated um, field. Um, Joanna Lewis and Michael Davidson and, and Alex Wong, a few people, we wrote this piece for science this year where we try to kind of pull apart these different security logics and actually go through what the economic and the kind of national security risks are. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some, right? So for instance, for wind turbines, there's a lot of fleet management that happens. You could technically hack into the software and um, sort of you know, take control of these wind parks. Um, but if, if we're worried about that, then we should be worried about every single power plant in this country, which also is not very well protected. Right. Um, I think in the battery space, there's concern about the kind of manufacturing skill and a lot of the military technology now uses batteries. Like it's all like battery driven drones and automatic this and that. And so there's some concerns there. But I think a lot of the thinking comes from the 1970s oil shocks where the tankers stopped coming and the country sort of fell apart without energy. And the difference in these technologies is that the solar panels are still going to work, even if we go to war with China tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. Like the ones that are already here are not just going to expire because of some geopolitical circumstances. So there's supply chain risk, and it's probably not a smart idea to rely on one place for such a high share, but it is sort of qualitatively, I think, a different context because, because what's already here is going to keep, keep working. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's sort of a problem that we now see. I think people are tuned out to the supply chain risk. And it turns out we were actually probably unaware of how concentrated some of the production was um, for many things, including semiconductors, right? Where certain minerals are just mined in China and they're absolutely essential. So it can be like these tiny little bottlenecks. Um, and so I think there's more of an effort now to kind of spread things out and diversify these supply chains. And I think that's, you know, that's a valid argument um, mm -hmm. to make. And also one that doesn't really actually mean we have to pull anything out of China because these markets are growing so rapidly. Everyone can kind of add to their share of the pie and, mm -hmm. and no one has to really lose out in that sense. But, um, but yes, there's some security vulnerability in that sense, but I think it's mostly a supply chain vulnerability and mm -hmm. sort of you know, question would China be willing to weaponize it in that way. I have other questions, but I'm sure other people do as well. So before we turn online, I'll just see if anyone who can. So Minya was asking about the difference between wind and solar, basically, I think was the, the thrust of her question. I'm probably not doing it justice, but you can check and see if you want. Um, the difference between... How those value chains work, right? So, I mean, if there is a difference. Yeah. So the value chains are very different, the organized. Um, wind is more clustered, there's sort of global clusters. You do a lot more production near the kind of installation side because they're very heavy to ship. Solar only has a few steps and they're not that difficult to ship. They're standardized, they fit into containers and so you can make everything in China and then ship it around the world. Mm -hmm. In terms of this kind of division of labor though, I see a very similar pattern, even though the supply chains are quite different. Because in the wind industry, there's sort of lead plants that do a lot of the innovation. And so for instance, in the component tree, um, you see the sort of collaboration between German and Chinese firms, the components can be shipped. 
and then five and then the sort of final assembly might be somewhere else but that's not really where the collaboration sort of on the innovation side happens mm -hmm. and so so i think the collaboration sort of exists on both sectors it looks slightly different it's embedded in different supply chains that sort of have different characteristics simply because of the physical features of these these plants and so in wind we are a lot less afflicted by these security concerns that you mentioned mm -hmm. um, because you can basically shift production if there are clusters all around the world um, mm -hmm. to do this but cutting china out of it would also make things more expensive because they have you know done a lot of innovation on trying to kind of get the cost of complementary down um, and develop kind of innovative solutions for that i have a big question we're seeing more pop up online so you might want to check but if China is so good at mass manufacturing wind and solar parts, and they have such capacity at doing it, why do they build new coal plants domestically all the time? <laughs> like what, you know, and what will it take basically to get China domestically to reduce? I mean, what, I know you think about this stuff all the time, but yeah. like, what is the path through which we get emissions peaking in China by 2030? And then, I mean, the, the coal thing is, so at the at the most basic level, I think what we need to change in China is the kind of incentivization of basically any kind of activity through GDP and kind of economic uh, growth, right? And so you see this competition between um, different provinces. The problem with you know the benefit with coal is you can build a coal power plant anywhere, and it can create local economic activity. I mean, if the price of coal is such that you can make money with it. Um, if you do wind and solar, a lot of the wind and solar resources are like in Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia. So you have to buy power from other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, but that means Shanghai is essentially giving GDP to other parts of the country and it doesn't count towards your own goals anymore, right? And so China doesn't have yet really a national power market. It's moving in that direction. There are pilots and all sorts of stuff. Companies can do these direct uh, purchase agreements and so on. But for the most part, power trading between provinces is still determined administratively. Mm -hmm. And so in that system, sometimes coal makes a lot more kind of political sense from kind of an incentive structure mm -hmm. um, than, than these other things. And, and I mean, power sector reform has been, you know, on the books really as a goal for almost 10 years at this point, and very little has actually kind of materialized. Um, and so the flip side of it is not just that we build these coal power plants and keep building them, but also that sometimes all the wind that's being produced in sort of the interior can't be exported because no, there's no buyers for it. And so it just goes to waste. In some provinces, 30% of it goes to waste. So, um, yes, and I, and I think it's a sort of interesting time because China for the longest time has had such rapidly increasing energy demand. So you could build more coal and also more solar and wind and everyone would get more. But I think that's changing now. The economy you know, obviously is cooling and um, power demand is also not rising anymore. And so now any new additions of these new technologies are sort of causing direct distributional battles between mm -hmm. the owners of the old stuff and the owners of the new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and they're often kind of, you know, administrative units in the same government. Thank you, Anne, for Minya's question. Um, Any questions here? Otherwise, I'll, I'll talk. And, and yes, I think they had to go in, and like, I think you'll probably have questions too. Um, uh, but I just want to make sure there's a good chance to ask. Um, so, I guess this. Is the China Economy Lecture Series? So this makes sense. Obviously, we're trying to yeah look at um, maximization from a um, welfare or an enhanced welfare externality, including environmental externality and so on and so forth. So I just want to throw out a different exercise, right? Which is similar to the answer you just gave to Meg about um, coal and so forth. Um, if the U.S. or Germany's goal is not so much to maximize efficiency. Or sort of welfare units and as externality unit as we considered it, but instead was to maximize employment. Um, or let's put it differently, assign a different externality weight to full employment as opposed to lag employment, and right, with the spillover externalities from knowledge creation and so on and so forth. 
how would this change the analysis in terms of what type of collaboration you would want to formulate or not, right? In other words, what I sense going on in the policy debate is not just about supply chain resiliency, national security, along the question that Meg is posing, but also a renewed debate on both the left and right about what's the right unit of analysis for maximization from the economic welfare function. So I just wanted you to sort of maybe posit, right, if we accepted a different unit of analysis of what we're trying to maximize, how would that change the analysis here? And in some ways, I feel like the argument of the book and the argument that you're giving the talk is China, U.S., and Germany have each have a slightly different welfare maximization formula, right, that it's using, which has led to a collaborative advantage in the global economy. Um, but that equation is being rethought in both the U.S. and Germany. So I just wanted to invite you yeah, to sort of comment, uh, particularly since we're in the economy series here, I, I'm thinking in, in along those lines. I mean, I think if I can talk about the U.S. for a second, I think the U.S. is sort of a really difficult case for all of this, because in some ways, the U.S. historically is the biggest investor in R&D in these industries and sort of is foundational to a lot of the technologies that are that I'm talking about in this book, but also the new stuff that's coming out. And this particular specialization in the US, which I didn't talk about in the talk, but which is one of essentially having excellent research universities and an excellent kind of infrastructure for spinning off technology into startups, um, is one that benefits from this incredible public investment in R&D, but also yields the least kind of economic footprint on the ground directly, right? The footprint that we get in the US is through China, right? So like these technologies are developed here, they're then sort of commercialized collaboratively in China and then they come back. And then we have these large service industries domestically that employ a lot of people that install them and maintain them um, and do all, the, all those things. And I think politically that doesn't really play well in the US because we have this very irrational obsession with manufacturing, um, which is the one part that the, the US kind of specialization doesn't get. So one way of changing sort of welfare maximization in that sense would be to improve the service sector jobs um, in these industries and sort of also be more realistic about the manufacturing industry in these, in these industries looks like. Right? Um, solar manufacturing is almost entirely automated. Nobody works there. And battery manufacturing also is very low on kind of employment. I mean, batteries are manufactured in kind of dry rooms where the humidity is so low that people can only be in there for kind of 15 minutes at a time and need to be shifted. And this is not like, you know, thousands of people having union jobs in a double garage and, and sort of 1950s American manufacturing. And so, so I think that's a political problem in a way. Um, but that political problem, of course, is now driving how countries are thinking about this and pushing kind of a reorganization of um, of these supply chains that I think is going to make it more expensive and difficult to get a lot of the stuff on the ground in the timeline that we need to get it on the ground in order to fix the climate problem. And so that's kind of how, um, how I think about it. But I also think it's not entirely unreasonable that you want some manufacturing and some sort of industrial capabilities um, to happen domestically. The problem with the American approach is that basically sort of the way that we think in this country about R&D um, is, is really kind of hasn't changed since the post-war decades. And so it's a sort of funnel type system, right? You pour money into basic research and then it eventually trickles out into the economy and creates domestic industries. And that still happens, except those industries are no longer here because collaboration in, in global supply chains allows these industries to spring up in places that are much better equipped to do that. And so I think the system is sort of broken in that sense, but we haven't really kind of adapted our expectations um, for our way of funding things. And so that's kind of what's coming to a head now with, um, with some of these new policies here, which I think are good. Um, the problem is that I think we should be learning from China more. If we really want to do more manufacturing, we need to figure out who's paying and financing and giving loans for these plans. And so the Inflation Reduction Act creates local content requirements, but then doesn't actually offer any of the kinds of institutions that firms get in China um, in order to meet these local content requirements. So that's a different talk, but you know, we are now kind of in the US very clearly linking our climate ambition to industrial development outcomes without really having tested whether we're actually capable of meeting those industrial development targets. And so we could be up for um, kind of a surprise if none of these goals are being met. 
um, no one get the tax credits because China just happens to be better at doing this stuff and we haven't really figured out how to compete uh, on that scale. So I think that also just answers the first yeah. question there. Yeah. Yeah, I think the last question is exactly sort of what I mean. I mean, I think there is a sort of shift here, right? And um, and in many ways, that shift makes a lot of sense. But it's, I think, it's a game of different timelines. Like, can you actually mount kind of a productive response to this um, without kind of cutting the relationships, of, you know, early? Mm -hmm. And I also think um, that kind of a complete. There's a sort of idea that you can actually be autonomous, and I think that's very, that's a total myth. We're seeing this in the semiconductor industry where once you start digging, I mean, there's so many suppliers that are needed for the production equipment that have 95, 100% of global market share for that one particular product that they make. And I think that the OEMs are actually not very well aware of where those supply chain bottlenecks are and are, which is why they're being caught by these surprises when we have a global crisis and you get the sort of situation where no one can buy a car because some kind of mineral that you need to make a plastic for manufacturing equipment then kind of stops chip manufacturing for, um, for these cars. So I think, so I think governments would like it to be more competitive. Um, I think firms are much more comfortable with continued collaboration. I think we're seeing that play out in the German case as well, where there's a lot of criticisms and then the German chemical manufacturers go and say, okay, we're spending $15 billion this year on the plants in China. So they continue to work on this collaborative um, kind of pattern, um, but there's, a, there's definitely a tension now. And I don't think we'll ever get to a world where it's like, everything can be uh, within national borders. I think it will always be a combination of both. Um, but from a political perspective, I also think if we want to keep going in this direction, we have to show some political results domestically and some jobs. Um, and so it can't be one, you know, either or in that sort of absolutist way. And so there'll be more competition. And I think that's maybe also motivating um, and some collaboration will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Scary. <laughs> the scary future, actually. But we'll see. I, I also don't think that there's anything fixed about this. You know, I'm picking on these three countries because they're sort of very stylized examples of how it works. There are other collaborative relationships between other countries that, you know, have a similar kind of mechanism. And we're also now seeing it more and more in these legacy sectors, like so EVs looks a lot like wind and solar because of batteries, yeah. but traditionally the auto sector maybe didn't really look like that because we had sort of the rust belt and mm -hmm. a lot of manufacturing in Michigan. And so there was a different global division of labor. Um, so, so I think in some ways this is now quite ingrained in the global economy. And so there's this current fad of saying we can redirect supply chains and do everything domestically. And I think that's very, I think that's likely going to be much harder than and the government's thing. Because in an ideal world, we want both jobs and to limit emissions and yes. <laughs> to find a way. And so it seems like, it, I mean, I guess what I'm taking away is that some of those goals trade off with one another. Yes, and there's also an underappreciation for what China's bringing to the table, right? I think there's a sort of conversation in the West about cheap inputs and, and this is just about scale and mm -hmm. kind of, you know, essentially throwing cheap energy and labor at the stuff. And I think there's a lot of, know how yeah. um, in these sectors. I mean, there's definitely a trade-off between speed of um, environmental climate change and adaptation technology. Yeah. And right. particularly the adaptation technology, I think people are missing, right? Yeah. And the cost of that versus supply chain resiliency and jobs for advanced economies. Right. And it's interesting, I mean, like you would change a welfare unit if it were, you know, maximizing efficiency of toys, right? Which is different than maximizing efficiency of deploying effective, you know, solar panels, I guess. Yeah. So that's why I asked about yeah. the, where if you change the maximization function, right, right, then the optimal point, right, is a, a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But it's 
at the end of the day, it's an ideological political choice. I feel like we're making two technologies these competing priorities. Mm -hmm. To pretend we can do both is a little bit. Right. There is a, also sort of, there's a couple of really interesting political science papers that essentially argue that these industries are politically also very salient because people associate them with the future. And so, you know, even the Trump administration picked trade wars with China on solar, even though that administration in particular had very little interest in bringing solar back to the US. Mm -hmm. but, it, but because these industries are sort of politically getting a lot of attention, if you're going to choose, um, a sector within which to argue this stuff, you know, you know, washing machines just doesn't get you the same kind of political mm -hmm. attention. And so, unfortunately, these are sectors where we need these relationships, but they're also more vulnerable politically because, because of sort of the way that they're being perceived and talked about publicly. Um, I mean, they're the closest we have to kind of strategic industries here now. Um, and so I think people are a lot more attuned. Big problems. Lots of work to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for the book too, which teaches us a lot about how we got to the point where we are now. So um, thanks thank for you. the title. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm good at naming books, I, and it's not my own, so I'll need some <laughs> help when I'm finishing this one. But anyway, so join me in thanking Professor Nam. I could end the meeting if you want. Um, I feel like.